All right, we are live. How's everyone doing? This is Rob from Rob's School of Music. I'm here with the legendary Nick Perry, and we're going to talk all kinds. Of, we're going to talk music. I don't know about legendary, but, but I'm, I'm a guy. I think you're a legend. I certainly do. Um, I tell you, I I came upon you. I was out at the Nam show, like when that first Silver Tide record happened, and I was waiting online for something, and Walt was there. And I, it was like on the bottom floor, where like the more up and coming like bands were, you know, or more up and coming companies. And uh, I just started bullshitting with him. He was so nice and friendly. And he said, you guys had a gig, I guess that night or the next night somewhere. It's the Troubadour or the Key Club or something. And it was incredible. Well, thanks, man. I can't believe you remember that. I, I vaguely remember that. I actually think the story was we had an, a gig the night before at the Roxy which was our like big LA debut. I know we had a gig, another gig, maybe it was in Anaheim or somewhere in Orange County that was probably the next day as well. But we had just come from a gig the night before and it was our first headline show in LA ever. And we had spent time there because we had made our record there. So we we were there for, I, I think I, I was there for probably 18 months because I stayed longer when the record was mostly done i stayed the latest i was the only one in the band who was single um so i volunteered to stay you know and kind of finish up button up some of the overdubs that were pending and and just kind of put you know uh have at least one band member there for the beginning of the mixing and all that stuff so i stayed um it it, it was a, a wonderful moment in time but i remember that was like our first big show back and we partied our faces off and um, that NAMM show was a little bit blurry. Yeah, I, I tell you, dude, you're right. That's definitely how it went. It was the Roxy, and then it was the next day. It's, it's a lot that's blurry in my mind. But I remember, like, I don't even know why we wound up at that show. Uh, I was there with my drummer, and my dad was out there with us. And uh, Jesus, like, I was like, who is this guy shredding? And then, uh, obviously, here you are all these years later, still shredding away. So it's just so cool to, like, Get to talk to you and then have that little memory from way back when it, it's, it's special for me so thank you that's so cool i had no idea you were going to bring that up i hadn't even thought about that in such a long time but that 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 was a wild a wild moment in time that whole trip man it just feels like i mean i know that i lived it and and you know i do have great memories of it but it just feels like it was like a different lifetime <laughs> it's so weird you know because we we started so young and I call it joining the circus because I was in like Catholic school with a shirt and tie and one minute and the next minute I was on tour in Japan and it, it, re it really went down like that. Like, you know, we got signed so young. I didn't even finish school. They yanked me out of school. And um, so it was just like this whirlwind. And then when I was 22 and, and the band was over, I started to, to like catch my breath and go like, oh, wow, like I'm an adult. I have no idea what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I knew I knew I was going to do music, but I like, you know, there were basic life skills that I missed along the way that I had to learn, like how to do laundry. <laughs> yeah, I, st I still haven't learned how to do that. My girlfriend just yells at me constantly. So, so yeah, my, my wife says I'm the worst still at it. So I, I I'll, I'll wash the clothes. I'll just forget to put them in the dryer. And then two days later, it's like, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> this must moldy mess in the washer. Yeah, cool. That makes me feel very validated. So I don't know if my girlfriend's watching, but see, I'm not alone. <laughs> He's not alone. It's it's tough for men. So, uh, dude, so we're a music school. We're in uh, Rockland County, New York, which is uh, like right on the New Jersey border. Suffern is the town. And uh, we, we do music lessons and we were doing them awesomely until COVID came. And then we moved everything online. And, you know, thank God we've done over 2,500 online lessons since then. It's been killer. Um, it's amazing. Thought, yeah, thanks, dude. It, it's I pinched myself because it could have gone so many different ways. Um, but I started doing these interviews to try and like let the students see that like, hey, the world is, it's not that big and we still can connect and talk to people. And, uh, you know, you were, you were very high up on my list. So this is really cool. Um, well, thanks so much. And how cool that you're doing that. I mean, mad respect, man. Uh, that's just so awesome. As a dad now, like I, I have a whole new respect uh, for teachers of any kind. Uh, what a wonderful job and such an important job uh, anytime that, that you have the opportunity to 
share knowledge with 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 young people it's like it's the best it's the best yeah thanks it's special it's special so you're doing great work thank you thank you yes there's my sound bite yes <laughs> um so the first question i try and ask everyone um you have played epic stages around the world literally uh from from a young age you know and up until up until now and i think we're, we're right around the same age so um a lot of our students when we could perform we would put them together into bands and get them playing out regularly book them shows at local bars street fairs town fairs whatever um and anxiety nerves stage fright is a huge factor in in a young musician not age-wise but just experience wise um do you have any tips on how to cope with nerves wow that's a great question i don't know that i've ever been asked that yeah cool. um it, it's real and, and you know to this day I'm, i remember you know just last week we're, we've been fortunate enough with my band at the at the moment that that i'm leading to kind of fall into this circuit of doing drive-in shows and i've been very fortunate that a, a a handful of really great bands and friends of mine have asked me to come out and support them um we did some shows with the struts we did some shows with blackberry smoke um and to do the drive-in thing at this moment in time well it's it's you know of course it's different but it's um, just a wonderful, I'm so grateful that I had the chance to do them. So I was just on stage last week and feeling that feeling that we're talking about now, which is like a mix of nerves and adrenaline. And, um, you know, I will say that it never goes away, but that's a good thing. And, and, and what I've learned is that like, you know, you want a little bit of it. It's, it's actually a healthy thing because adrenaline, you know, our bodies send us adrenaline for a number of reasons. And the idea is that, um, you know, your body thinks it's like fight or flight, right? So you kind of just have to learn to harness it a little bit so that it's working for you and not against you. And, and I think that that does come with time. Um, but but it, uh, I will say that, you know, again, even to this day, I've been performing for over 20 years in front of people. It's still there, you know what I mean? But I think the ultimate key and, and this is just a life lesson that I've learned over, over the years and over time, um, you know, not to get too spiritual and stuff, but it really has to do with the mind and, and how we control our minds versus our minds controlling us. And, you know, the mind is like a super powerful thing and it's a great tool. You know, it's like a, it's like a calculator and it's like when you need it to do a task, it's a great tool that you can use, but you don't want it ruling your life. And this is a much deeper conversation that, you know, could, 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 happen here but through my journey and my experience on this planet you know I've, I've spent vast amounts of time trying to figure out how to um wrangle the, the the mind right and not and not be um destroyed by it because it the the mind left to its own devices will do crazy things and there's a lot of artists who can attest to this because we are sensitive people by nature and um our minds run wild with insecurities and all this stuff and you're not good enough and what if you make a mistake and all this and this but the good news is for all kids watching out there that the truth is 99.9 percent .9 of the time n none of the things that you run through your head actually happen you know it's just you're worried about these things and you spend time like well what if i do this or what if i miss up this part or what if i hit a wrong note or what if i fall off the stage like you know our minds are just the, these like crazy things right so the idea is just like to calm the mind and just breathe and just do what you do if you've put in the time and this is what i say with my own band all the time it's like uh, i rehearse a lot i spend a lot of time rehearsing i know that there are people who don't like rehearsing uh, i could never be in a band with one of them because i i rehearse and my bandmates will tell you at nauseam you know i actually rehearse for our rehearsals so I'll rehearse at home and, and I do this regularly. So like, for example, I, we're not gonna play now for I don't know how long, it may be weeks, it may be months, we don't know until we get another drive-in show or there's another live stream or whatever it is. But once a week, no matter what, I will be running in my studio here, I will be running the entire show, the whole show, every song that we would ever possibly play right now, I will be running a minimum of once a week and when I get wind that something is going to come up, I'll bump that up to two, three times a week by myself. I'll just keep rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing because I want it to be muscle memory. And then I then we get with the band. Then we do days and days with the band. And 
when everybody goes like, okay, I think we got it. Then we're going to do one more rehearsal because that's the way I found to beat it. And if you're really well rehearsed and well prepared, you just turn the mind off. And then the, it's so weird and it's crazy, but, but the body, the, the adrenaline that we talked about earlier, it kicks in and it's like your fingers know what to do and your voice knows what to do. And then you just do it. It's, it's actually, I don't know how it scientifically works, but it works every time and it's great. I'm just grateful that it does, you know? So I think the real trick is to just turn off the mind and don't think about the show. When I wake up on a show day, I try not to think about the show. I'll busy myself doing anything. I don't want to think about the show because it'll make, it'll make my day suck because I'll be nervous. And then I've come to learn that it's just wasted energy because nothing that I ever think is going to happen on stage happens. It's always fine. So as long as you put in the time. So I, so I would tell anybody who's getting into this line of work or, or just having fun with it and wants to play music in a live setting um, to be prepared. And if you're prepared, then don't worry about it and find something to quiet the mind. You know, backstage, you can play cards, you can play, you know, uh, video games. Like I, band, I've had band members just do whatever up until the moment, you know, that it's time to get ready and go. So just like do something else. Don't think about the show, you know? And then when you get up there, if you put in the time, it'll all come together. Dude, I love that answer. Um, I, you know, the mind part of it is it's what gets left out of the equation. Everyone's worried about all these what ifs, but you're right. Everyone gets in their own head. Um, I'm the same way. I'm super rehearsed with everything. I think there's no other way to do it. Um, if you're going to do it, do it right. Um, congrats on the new record. It's awesome to hear you sing it a bit. Um, congrats on all the Gibson stuff you've been doing too. It's uh, really cool. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. That was a fantastic answer. That that threw me back. <laughs> um, all right. So what was your first, the first record you got and or the first show you saw that made you say that I want to do that? I have a very clear answer for you. I'll never forget it. So I, I alluded earlier about the Catholic school. And, and so I grew up in like a very conservative household. Um, you know, uh, my sister and I went to Catholic school. Um, mine was all boys even, it, you know, shirt tie, the whole thing. It was a very, you know, I didn't have rock and roll in the house. People think, like, oh, you must, have grown, you must have grew up with it. Like, not really. You know, my dad is born and raised in Italy. So we had like the three tenors on all the time. Uh, my mom was like on the folkier side growing up. So she liked James Taylor and, and Rod Stewart, like when he went solo and, and did the more, you know, Maggie Mae stuff, which is awesome. Uh, but uh, there was no like rock music in the house. You know, my aunt, my mom's sister, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, but she, she just played the most incredible role in my life. Um, she was a wonderful human being. And um, she was like the black sheep of the family. So she she had crazy spiky hair and she loved rock music. And uh, I'll never forget, it was Thanksgiving. And she gave me two cassette tapes. This is when I was 11. It must have been when I was 11 because I started playing. By the time I was 12, I was playing. So um, she gave me Highway to Hell by ACDC. And she gave me Pearl Jam 10. This is the 90s, you know. So they were on cassette. And... Uh, it was absolutely, I can't even, there's no possible way to overstate it. Like the, they don't make words that actually could summarize that feeling, but it was like a bolt of lightning hit me, you know? And it, and it was just, I had never heard electric guitar sound that way, you know? Like I've come to learn, you know, like this tool can just do awesome things, but I didn't know it then. And I was like, what is making that sound? You know, like, oh, my God, it's a guitar. It's an electric guitar. How do I get one of them? You know, it's just like this this thing. And it, it changed my whole life. It changed everything about, like, literally from one minute to the next. Like, I was not the same person. And it sent me on this path. I'm still, you know, very obviously following today. And I have no intention of ever stopping. So it's it changed my whole, my whole life projection of trajectory of where I was going. Um, so yeah, it was mega. I thought, dude, Pearl Jam and UCDC, that is definitely a great way to say that's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, there was no question. It, was, it wasn't even a question. It was just like, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Pearl Jam is my favorite band of all time. So we're next. Good. Good I there. love Pearl Jam, man. I love Pearl Jam. <clears throat> 
Versus is also an, another insane album. Uh, I remember getting that. That that was one of the first CDs when comp when CDs compact discs when they came out. You know, I was I was young still, but but the, you know that was like a new thing. You know, yes. and uh, do you remember the first CD you ever bought, like with your own money, the actual like CD? I do, but I'm embarrassed to say what it is. It was uh, it was crisscross jump around. Oh my god! Yeah. Don't be embarrassed. That's awesome. Dude, I saw Criss Cross, so that wasn't my first rock show. Uh, I'll get to that. Well, well, you asked that question as well. So my first rock show I saw was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at, uh, yeah, I think it was called the Tweeter Center now, uh, or the E Center. Now it's, I don't know what it's called, but it's in Camden, New Jersey. It's right over the bridge from Philly, but it's an amphitheater. I saw Tom Petty. That was like the first rock and roll show that, that I saw, and, and that was incredible, but before that, my, the first live music that I ever saw was after a Sixers game, a Philadelphia 76ers basketball game, and it was Criss Cross. Yeah. It, it was like if you bought a Sixers ticket, you got to stay to see Criss Cross, you know, with the pants on backwards and the whole thing. You have to. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, anyway, what I was going to say is my first compact disc CD purchase was Aerosmith Get a Grip, nice. um, which, again, at the time that was happening, you know, you had Alicia Silverstone or whatever her name is in all, on those videos. And that was like a big moment for them, a big part yeah. of their comeback. Right. Um, but I remember, I think the second or third CD I ever bought was Versus on CD with the sheep on the with, on the front. What an amazing record that is. I'm, I'm born in 83. So I imagine we're, we must be very close. Cause our yeah. still line up. I'm, the, still I'm, I'm, I'm 84. There you go. Yeah. That makes sense. Wow. That's so cool. Um, was when you first started playing, was were you like super studious? Or were you like, I need to know my theory and my scales and all that stuff? Or were like, what was your practice routine like in the beginning? To be honest, I just wanted to learn how to play fast. <laughs> I mean, what kid doesn't, you know? But um, I, I had a mission. It was, I wanted to write, immediately I wanted to write songs. I, I didn't want to like, I mean, you know, there were moments where I was learning, um, you know, riffs. I remember learning Come As You Are. Um, I remember learning, um, you know, uh, I think the first guitar solo I actually learned was Shook Me All Night Long, like note for note. Um, and I, I got into Guns N' Roses, so I was learning like Sweet Child of Mine and stuff like that. Um, but, but from a very early age, my focus was no, like, I didn't want to play covers. I, I wanted to write my own music. And I don't know why. There wasn't like I grew up around songwriters. You know, it wasn't like anyone was telling me like, write your own songs. Um, although I tell it to people now all the time. Like if, if you want to make a career in music, you know, write your own songs. Uh, but for whatever reason, that's just the path that I took. So I, I, I wanted to learn and I wanted to be able to write songs and to express myself and do my own thing. And for whatever reason, again, from an early age, that was just like high on the agenda for me. So I, I did take lessons um, for a short time to kind of get the basics. And I think it's a great idea for anybody who wants to learn any instrument to, to, to take lessons. Um, because why not be able to soak up music, especially in person or, or I mean, even on a situation like this, like to be able to just interact and go like, oh, this is a C chord. Oh, this is why it doesn't sound right. I'm not supposed to hold this note, you know? Like that, that, that experience is so, is so important. That being said, I didn't stick with lessons for a long time. Uh, I started, well, I figured out that I, I had a good ear and that I could pick up stuff. And I had a turntable. And um, once I really started getting into rock and roll, I had some mentors that were around me, some older musician types that I met actually in, initially through my church. Um, and they really like, you know, they steered me in the right direction. So I was getting like Led Zeppelin and Tommy by The Who. And, and like, I was just, I was digesting this stuff. Cause you have to imagine, like I started playing at age 12, I got signed at 16. So like in that four years, wow, I was digesting like school for me was just out, you know, like, and, but I still went, but, and I still did my homework and I still got good grades, but it was like, I was not thinking about that at all. It was like every waking moment outside of passing the test. Like it was just music, music, music. And I was just like sponging, soaking it all up from every angle. So when I figured out, Oh, I could, I could 
go back and, and drop the needle and go back and go back and go back and like hear it on repeat and then figure it out. Then I sort of started running from that, you know, so, excuse me, running with that and, and going from there. So um, I do remember, you know, many hours, you know, probably hundreds of hours with records. Uh, this is before YouTube. It's before, you know, anybody had stuff like that. You couldn't go to ultimate guitar.com or whatever and get the tabs for stuff. So uh, you just had to figure it out. I do, I do remember in Guitar World, right, they had transcriptions. I, I, I think they still do. So um, I, I was simultaneously learning stuff from there. And, and I, I think like once I got the basic building blocks, like it was like, okay, like I understood what Angus was doing and how he built that solo. You Shook Me All Night Long is a really good one because I believe it, and it's been years since I've played it or, or really listened to it intensely. But if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's got major pentatonic, it's got minor pentatonic. It's, it, it, it really is a nice case study in how uh, different melodies and different phrases work over different chords. Because I believe that that solo even goes through a couple different chord changes. Right. So learning that was really important for me because I got to like, oh, OK, when it changes and then then it is major, you're like and figuring it out. And like so when I started to unlock certain things, then I was like, OK, cool. Now I'm going to take this and like run with it and do my own thing. So there, there were those moments along the way that like pieces of the puzzle started to unlock. But I will say and sorry for this really long winded answer, but I, I, I will say a few years ago, um, before I started this album, I actually went back and I took some guitar lessons again. Um, just because I want, I was feeling a little stuck and I wanted to understand, I don't know music theory. And some, some people have said, you know, I mean, look, there's a million different ways that people appreciate and love and play music. And I don't think that any one thing is the right answer. It's whatever you want to get out of it, you know? whatever direction you're going in i mean if you want to you know be in the next steely dan like you better know your music theory yeah. you know what i mean now i love steely dan and that's actually why i went back to take lessons because i wanted to know what are some of those chords what like why is larry carlton because i can play kid kid charlemagne i learned it by ear it's hard but i wanted to know why why does it work why does that solo work over those chord changes, you know? And so I still have questions and, and I haven't gotten the answers to all my questions. So I, I would assume at some point when I can come up for air again, that, that I will go back and take more lessons because I, I don't think that you ever stop learning, you know? And for me, most of my career has been spent playing bluesy rock and roll, uh, writing songs and just making it up as I go. And it's certainly taken me where I am and, and I'm, 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 not going to complain about that, but I do still crave, you know, to learn more. And I play every day. I don't. I don't call it practicing. I, I, I play. And people say like, how often do you practice? And what do you practice? And I go, I don't practice. I, I just like playing. So I'll, I'll sit down. I'll have a guitar in my hands. I'll turn on all my, you know, my equipment down here, and I'll just start messing around. And you know, I just find the more that you play and play and play, you. you your mind, because again, going back to the mind thing, it is a beautiful, wonderful tool. And it uh, little by little does unlock things. The other night I was sitting and I was, I connected something I had never done before. And I was like, ooh, I just leveled up. <laughs> right? You know, and I was like, so that still happens. And, and it's how great, you know, because it's, it's like a nice little shot in the arm. Sure. You know, it's interesting with the theory component is, is something I pride myself on with the school here is we don't, uh, for guitar for guitar students, I should say, we don't drill theory into them unless they really want to go down that hole. We try and give it piecemeal as needed. Um, I always give the reference point that when I first started playing guitar, I my teacher tried to teach it to me and I didn't care. I wanted to talk about girls and learn to play Metallica. And that was it. And uh, later on, I went to music school and I learned everything and I could do all the modes and all these things. But when the light shines on me, I play minor pentatonic every day because that's how I can emote the best way. So it, it's, it serves its purpose, but uh, I, I was talking to Billy Sheen a couple weeks ago on one of these interviews, and he's like, I don't know any theory, but I know this, blah, 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 sounds good with this, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you win. 
wow, that's amazing that he can play in a band with Paul Gilbert, who's like the theory right. monster. I, I mean, that it. guy is, he is uh, incredible. You know, it's its cool to me. Um, there's another gu- cat from the UK. Is his name Guthrie? Oh, Govan or something? Last time? Yeah. He's another one of these guys. I just think they're aliens. Like, because typically, and I don't want to, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. Like I said, there's a million different avenues of music and I respect it all. I, I truly do. But um, when, because you use the word emote, blues playing um, and, and minor pentatonic stuff, like to me, it's all about emotion. That's what, that's what it, that's what it is. And for me at this point in my life, I've actually, I feel like I'm, speed and and trying to play like fancy licks is like getting way bumped down on the list of important things to do like for me it well writing songs has always been number one i do love guitar and i love sounds and i love playing guitar there's no way to deny that but the older i get the more i i I, i'll much rather play something simple and i'm still like trying to perfect how to make this sound like a voice you know so it's like i want to get my playing as vocal as possible and as uh, emotive as possible, you know? Um, And, and, you know, I think that there's a school of people who who do that and there's the school of people who go about it a different way, let's say. Rare though, that you get guys who can do both. You know what I mean? I think that Paul Gilbert is a guy who's like, man, he knows, he's got chops for days. He knows all that crazy stuff, but he also can play with feeling, you know? And, and I respect that. I think that's cool. Very good point. I saw him at the Iridium a couple of years ago, and that was exactly what I was. I actually went with my original guitar teacher. We're both in the front row watching Paul Gilbert. Like, we're both 13 years old. And on the car ride home, that's exactly what we were saying. Like, this guy can make you cry, but still use a thousand notes. That's that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, let's talk gear for a second. So I, I recently watched your rig rundown, and uh, I was – enamored with all your toys and things. Um, first question before it gets too technical, you're on a desert island and you can have one guitar and one amp and one pedal. What would it be? Oh, wow. That's a really hard question. I, I asked it to um, Zach Myers and uh, he pulled out a 59 last ball and a dumble. And I said, you win. <laughs> Yeah, that's above my pay grade. But I'll tell you what, Yeah, this Firebird is not, this is a 76. I think at the moment, if you asked me today, well, you did just ask me today, it would be, <laughs> it, would, it would be this guitar. This is a 76 um, Bicentennial Firebird, Gibson Firebird. And uh, it was one of those magic things that I, I uh, began to touch on it in the rig rundown, but I didn't elaborate, so I'll give you a more elaborate thing. Um, I, I met a gentleman on the on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, Jason Roberts, friend of mine, uh, big time guitar collector, gear enthusiast, uh, enthusiast. Can't talk for some reason tonight. Um, must need more coffee. Uh, I'm double fisting it over here. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So uh, I met him on you know it was like one of these classic uh, guitar deals on the side of the road. You know, um, only in this business anyway. Uh, I'm literally on the side of the road on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. We met at a rest stop and he's like, dude, you got to see this guitar. So it was in a case and he goes, you know, we go around to the back of his SUV. He opens up the thing and he's like, what, what? You pick it up. You do it. So um, I reached into the case and I put my hand on the neck and I hadn't even taken the guitar out yet. But as soon, because for me, it's all about the way they feel. Sure. And I, I, I went like this and I like touched the neck. I didn't tell him yet. But in my mind, I was like, I'm definitely buying this guitar <laughs> because it was some like magic thing. And I've, I've owned a lot of guitars over the years and people who know my story, you know, I, I, there were times where I was, um, you know, in certain bands or playing with certain artists and touring the world and, you know, obviously making money at the, in, you know, in those moments. And then there was a lot of moments where I wasn't. So one thing I've always done through my career is I've always invested in, in in gear. When I had money, I buy gear. And when I need money, I sell gear. And it's a, it actually worked out pretty well because um, as most people know, you know, if you buy the right stuff, gear can be a good investment. That being said, because 
my experience in this business has been feast or famine, feast and famine so many times, yin yang and back and forth, that um, I've owned a lot of stuff. I currently own not that much stuff and, and I'm totally okay with it. I'm, I'm hopefully going back on the upswing and I'll be acquiring more as we go. But um, I've really stripped things down and, and in doing so, learned a lot about myself. I mean, again, at risk of getting spiritual, I, you know, how many things do we need is the question. And Dude, get spiritual, go deep. It's all good. I'm down with that. 100%. We, we, the truth is we can't take any of this stuff with us. Number one. Number two, I don't care what anybody says, you can't care for 100 guitars, period, unless you're filthy rich and you can hire somebody to come in and tune them all, keep the truss rods going, change the strings, especially if you live on the East Coast and there's humidity and then there's dry, like you need a caretaker, you know, yeah. or, you, or that's what you're doing full time. So, um, you know, having something like that doesn't interest me. I'd like to have a small collection and I'm, I, I guess I'm on my way to doing it, but I'd like to have a small but potent collection uh, of stuff that I really play and enjoy. And if I'm not playing it, it's not here. I don't want anything just, you know, taking up space. So um, anyway, my criteria now is just all about the way it feels and if it's gonna make me feel something and inspire me when I'm playing, period, you know? So uh, of all the guitars that I have here, uh, and I have a great connection with all of them, they're all here for a reason. But when I picked up this guitar, it was just like, I've never had an experience this intense where it was just like, oh yeah, this is my guitar, my guitar. Like it instantly was like, it just felt like an extension of what it is that I'm already doing in the path that I'm on, if that makes sense. And with Silvertide, if you remember, and I don't know if I was at that show. I must have been playing a Firebird, a Black Firebird, yeah. when we saw it. Yeah. So I, I, I'm a huge Johnny Winter fan. So back then, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, um, I mean, that's really all I played was was a Firebird. So, but it'd been so many years since having one that when I picked it up, I was just like an old friend. I was like, "Hey, man, you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go." <laughs> so at, at this moment in time, I can't imagine playing anything else. So uh, it would definitely be this guitar. Um, I'm, I'm amp wise, I would say it would be a Marshall. It would be, I'm really enamored with this. Uh, I've got a little 18 watt, um, you know, it's like a miniature blues breaker, nice. um, all tube. It's, it sounds amazing and um, it's great natural overdrive. I don't know how well it's going to sound through the phone, but. Yeah, sounds great. That's just guitar and amp. Wow. And um, I only one pedal would be really tough. You know, I don't even know what I would say. If, if I had that amp and I could live with that overdrive forever, then it would probably be a Univibe um, or a delay. Maybe a, if you only have one pedal and analog delay, I would want something to keep me going for how many years am I on this island? Indefinitely. <laughs> Indefinitely. <laughs> it might actually be a delay, man. It might actually be a delay. I mean, I love fuzz faces. Uh, it, again, it would depend on the amp. But if I could have this amp, maybe it would be a delay. It would give me something to play with. Uh, but I don't know. I'm going to say this Firebird, that Marshall 18 watt combo, and a Maxon AD999 analog delay. Okay. Fair enough. That's a good rig. That's all you need. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to ask something weird here. A buddy of mine worked at a studio in Jersey, and I think he was working with David Bendith, may have been the producer, but he told me that there was a second Silver Tide record that never came out. Is that true? Can we answer that? Is that? I mean, I just gave it away, didn't I, with a smile? Yeah, um, yeah well... There's 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 a, there's material in the can, um, as as a full length album. It was never finished. It was abandoned before it could get to the finish line. Um, thank goodness it was. Really? Yeah. I mean the 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 Silver Tide thing. That album has become unbelievably. I mean I I, I don't really spend time thinking about it. Part of my MO um, and, and 
again, maybe it's because of, of just where I'm at in my life and, and whatever, but like, I don't spend time looking backwards, you know, um, I, I try to even not spend too much time looking forward. I try to just like live in the present as much as I can. Naturally, our, our brains, you know, they, it wants to look behind and forward always. Uh, I try not to let it do that, but I don't sit around thinking about silver tide too often, you know, but, um, I, often actually i am reminded about that record people write me almost every day about it you know um and it's still selling which is crazy it's become like a cult thing um and and we sold a lot of we, uh, you know that's back when cds were still sold we sold a lot of cds you know um so i'm grateful for that i'm grateful that people are still discovering it and and that stuff uh but i don't i don't think about it too often, but I am proud of the record. And I'm proud of um, the fact that we never put anything out to potentially diminish um, what we had going. And I think that the second record would have ruined it. Cool. We, we were all in a really tough, without getting too deep into it, we were in a really tough situation. We were young. Um, we were being um, a little bit misguided. And in hindsight, I'm just really glad the album never came out. I, I will say that there is other material that we're very proud of and that we love that should have been what the second record was that was turned down by the record label, um, which is really good stuff. And I, I've had a conversation not too long ago with, with uh, a couple former bandmates about the idea of, you know, like, hey, let's not forget about this stuff at some point we have to put it out. And, and I think at some point that stuff, even though it's in demo form, we'll probably see the light of day because the songs are good. And it's always about the songs, you know, it's about the songs and the songs are good. And even though that the production of them is, is not very good, uh, the, the songs are great. And I think that they deserve to be heard. Um, the stuff we did for the official second record, uh, and that, that's meaning no disrespect to anybody who worked on the record. I think everybody at the moment in time at that moment, we're all just trying to do what they thought was best. The problem is we had 11 people with management, label, band, producer, and everybody thought they knew what was best. But in the end, we had way too many cooks in the kitchen. And the actual thing that made us awesome and made us what we were, made us special, unfortunately got really watered down to the point where it didn't have its identity left. That's so. Really? I've learned a lot of lessons here along the way, and I not because I wanted to, but it just happened that way. Um, but Sammy Hagar gave me some really great advice. I, I was 20 years old. I was on tour with Van Halen, and uh, on the 2004 reunion tour with Sammy, and um, I'll never forget, he came out to the van, because we were in a van, and we were following this crazy tour schedule where the band um they were they were flying in a private jet from show to show and the shows were far apart and they had two complete individual completely you know duplicate stage rigs wow that were leapfrogging right so they'd set up here and then 500 700 800 miles away they'd be setting up the other one for the shows that were going to happen the next day and the day after whatever it was right so and this and the show was huge so you can imagine uh i mean i can, it's still mind-boggling to this day like what the budgets were for those things but um anyway we were doing it in a van and there were moments in time where we had to leave sound where we would play our show and thank god this wasn't every night this was just sometimes um but there it did happen where we would have to we'd play our show We'd go out to the merch booth. We'd sign autographs and stuff. We'd pack up our stuff. It would be like, you know, 8 p.m. Before Van Halen went on, we'd have to get in the van and start driving and drive straight through the night, not stop, drive, keep driving, keep driving through the morning, through the afternoon to get to sound check the next day. That's how far away the venue was. So <clears throat> Sammy came out. He's like, I heard this rumor that you guys were doing this tour in a van. I said it was impossible. And here you are in a van. He couldn't believe it. Number one, he's the sweetest guy in the world. And he actually paid for our first tour bus because he felt so bad that we were like, we were living in the van, man. You know, like it, it was intense. Um, and uh, so 
that's another story, but he's amazing. But he, he gave me advice, which I didn't listen to. And I, I, one of my few regrets to this day, he said, whatever you do, he's like, the, whatever the five of you are doing right now in this van and on stage, he's like, this is all that matters is what the five of you are doing right now. And it, it trust me, it's going to get, as you get more successful and the songs climb the charts, you're going to have people coming out of the woodwork. Everyone's going to have an opinion. Everyone's going to be telling you what they think you should do. Just don't stop being the five of you. Stay together. Don't let them divide and conquer, uh, which is exactly what happened. They split up the band into two guys and three guys. We were at war with each other. We were at war with ourselves. It was a total debacle, and, and it ruined everything we had going on, which was quite a lot of great stuff at that time. Uh, I wish we had listened to Sammy. Sammy gave us great advice. Don't stop being a band. The five of you stay together. All original members. Don't swap a guy. Even if he, you know, you think whatever, he made a mistake. Stay together. That was his advice. And if you look back at some of the great bands who lasted in the test of time, you know, it's because they've stayed together. Uh, if not all members, as many as possibly could. And um, I, I just didn't even know what he meant yet. Right. I was too young. You know, but um, that's a that's a lesson, not just for me, but to anyone who's watching. You know, if you have a good thing going, uh, remember that the thing that took you there is is a certain chemistry and a certain combination of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one change to that thing could could potentially change everything, you know, and, um, you know, we were. I was in a disagreement with our drummer and I thought, you know, without getting personal about stuff, you know, I just, uh, we were having a difference and I thought that um, changing the drummer would be the better thing for the band. It turned out it wasn't, it ruined the band, you know? Um, so I've learned some lessons, man. And uh, what a crazy business. Dude, thank you so much for sharing that though, because that story literally answered like five of the questions that I was going to ask you. So that was perfect. Really? Yeah. What have you learned? Anything you could change? Uh, difficult situation. Yeah, music industry is cut. Yeah, you just, you just, that was awesome. Perfect. It's like we planned it magically, but didn't plan it at all. <laughs> um, dude, thank you. So your new record, your guitar tone all over it is outrageous. Um, there's like, and I mean, this is the best compliment. There's like this Pink Floyd vibe in a lot of the songs that is just, so tastefully done. Um, what what gear were you using for it? Thank you, man. Um, most of the guitar, I I would say, uh, you know, I, I have a small arsenal of Gibsons here. So I've got uh, this Firebird I hadn't acquired yet. So this uh, hit the tuner here, so you're not getting uh, blasted. I didn't have the Firebird yet, but I I had a few. Uh, Gibson guitars. This is this has been around since the Silver Tide era. It's the only guitar I have left from that era. This is Bella, um, which I got prior to getting the Black Firebird. I did this was like all the early Silver Tide stuff. I used this guitar. Um, this this is on a lot of the record, uh, Sun Via, the new record. It's just a, a beautiful guitar. It, I have a connection with it that is very special and. It sounds, it's one of the best guitars I've ever heard for recording because the, the mid-range tone that comes out of this thing is so perfect for recording. It's like right where you want the guitar, you know? Um, so you're high passing and low passing much less. It's like, it's already just EQ'd. It's like ready, ready for mastering. <laughs> uh, so this is on a bunch of the record. I've got an SG, a Custom Shop 64. SG that is on a bunch of the record, which you saw in the beginning of the uh, video. Um, I don't have it here. It's in the shop getting a fret dress um, and, and a few other uh, doodads worked on. But I have a, a custom shop 59 um, Les Paul flame top, the whole thing. Her name is Duck. My daughter names my guitars. So um, all bets are off for where, where they're going to go. Um, I would say the majority of the record was uh, was those three Gibsons and and a Strat actually a Frankenstein Strat, um, 
very close to 69 spec, 1969. Um, and that, that was it. it. Just a small arsenal of Gibsons and, and one Strat. Um, I used some Marshall amps. But as I was going through, because I did this thing on my, on my Facebook and YouTube called Deconstructing, where I broke down every song on the record and went through the recording process and soloed all the tracks, um, which was a really fun thing. And I'm actually glad I did it because as my memory starts to, uh, you know, potentially drift over the years, it's nice to have a document of like, have it documented of what I used, what, at least what I could remember. Sure. So more of the record than I thought was actually cut on a Fender Pro Junior, which is, it's, I've, I'm looking at it here. Um, it's a Tweed Pro Junior. It's a little Tweed amp with two knobs, volume and tone. You just crank it up and they get loud. I mean, it's only 12 watts, but it's, it's loud. Um, but the key to all my tone, whether it's a little Marshall combo or the Marshall uh, stacks here or the Fender, it, you know, they got to be, it, it's the power, it's what you want is power tube breakup, not preamp tube. And the only way to get that is with volume. You know, I don't care about the preamp. I don't want it to be fizzy and fuzzy. I want that like clear singing sustain. And that comes from power tubes overdriving and the only way to get the power tube section of your amp to engage really is to is to have it turned up so i would much rather and that's why small amps are great for recording because i'd much rather have you know a 12 watt amp on 10 you know than have a 100 watt amp on one because that 100 watt amp ain't even it's not even on yet you know what i mean the tone's gonna suck so uh that's that's a big part of the equation um, I also have this old reverb tank. It's a Fender, a 1965 Fender tube reverb tank. And regardless of whatever amp I'm playing, I'm going through that tank. And that tank, believe it or not, even when, well, I never have it bypassed because I love the splash of it. But the, it, it, it does have a, a sound. And when I don't have it, which again is usually never, uh, I, I, I do miss it. So you can hear, it's not... The reverb isn't obnoxious, right. but but I do feel like it, the sound of that tank, because it's going through three additional tubes, and there's a certain warmth and a certain fatness that comes when I'm going through that tank um, in front of an amp. I, I don't run it through an effects loop. Most of my amps don't have effects loops. It's just right in front of the amp. So you go right into the tank, and then right the tank right into the input of the amp. So most of the record, you know, and, you know, I'm right, you know, have a couple pedals here and there, but what? most of the record, I would say, is the guitar, the reverb tank, and the amp, and just years of uh, experience of just trying to figure out, you know, how to make things play nice, right. um, impedance and all that stuff. But, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple thing. It's just about getting your amp to the sweet spot. That's what it's all about, because no pedal is going to simulate that, you know? So, like, people spend all this time talking about pedals. And I love pedals, and I got quite a few, you know? And and they're fun, but they're fun as an effect. I don't use any pedal to simulate anything. I don't really believe or subscribe to the idea of simulation. I think um, simulation in many ways Again, I'm, I'm going to stop myself here because we could spend another hour talking about uh, my, my view of, of where our world is going with simulation, but that's another show. Uh, <laughs> I like that one too, I think. <laughs> but, but why not go for the real thing? So it's like, well, you, you've got this amp, you're running it on two, and you're running this pedal to simulate your amp being loud. Well, just turn up your amp, dude. And if it's too loud for your house, get a smaller amp. The good thing is with combo amps, and Fender's doing a, a, a great job. They're reissuing these these amps and make you know you can get a champ, you know. Uh, but truthfully, the vintage ones, you know, uh, if you're not looking for a showroom piece or a collector's piece, you know, with that's never been like touched, those are ridiculously expensive. But used gear, you know. There's so much great used gear out there and you don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to put in a little time and a little effort. You know, Craigslist 
towards the end of the month when people are looking for rent money. Trust me, I know because I've been on the opposite side of it. Uh, it's a great time to go find used gear and used amps. I love buying old used amps, you know, because a lot of times people just want to get rid of them, you know. So I don't even remember how I acquired this old amp from the 60s. It's a GU12, but I'm pretty sure I got it for like, you know, 20 bucks. Like the dude was just like, get it out of here. Like now, obviously, you're not going to get that for 20 bucks. But, um, you know, I've seen them go for, for a few hundred bucks. And it's like, wow, you can get a real vintage amp that sounds awesome. You don't have to spend thousands, you know, you just have to look and like keep your eyes open. So I really think it's all about like each piece of gear uh, has potential to sound good or bad. It's like this guitar just doesn't just always sound good no matter what. It's like what what combination are you using with this guitar? You know, this guitar through the right amp with the right setting at the right volume could change the world could change some kid from Philly's life, you know, who hears Highway to Hell for the first time at age 12. You know, like, that's real. That happened to me. So it's like uh, the potential is there. And that's what's so great about music and about instruments and all that stuff. It's it's endless potential. It's about really what you do with it and finding your own voice. And it's, it's just in my experience, um, each piece of gear has like something to unlock. And, and you have to just mess with it and find out what makes it work, you know. But I, I've seen great amps. You know, people are like, ah, oh, it doesn't sound very good. And, you know, it's on six. And I'm like, well, have you ever turned it to nine? And they're like, no, well, turn it to nine. What happens? It sounds great. All right, great. Done. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, don't be afraid. The guy who I bought this Marshall combo from said he had never put it above four. And I was like, that's crazy. This amp has to be on 10. That's like what these, this amp has like, you know, one good sound. And it's when it's on 10. I'm not just saying that. It's like this particular model has less tubes than, 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 than other ones. So to get it going, it needs to be on 10. And when it's on 10, it sounds awesome. But on four, like, you know, it's not that special. So sorry for the long winded answer, but I get very passionate about this stuff. Dude, I, I, my, my, uh, my personal motto is I'm passionate about passion. So listening to you go deep in that, I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. And I'm a gear guy. So one of the most random things about having this music school um, is people bring stuff like for the kids to use. So like the a guy came the other day, he had like a, an old Ampeg amp, amp, late sixties, I think seventies, maybe something didn't work, but he wanted to just put it off. And he's like, let the kids use it, fix it up, whatever. So it's like, we've become this lit. Like I have a shelf out in front with all my pedals and I let the kids take the pedals out. Like you would a library book to borrow it. And, and you know, here, here's the difference between a, a phase 90 and a phase 45. You know, mess around with this, see what you like. Here's here's the 535Q wah versus the uh, the Vox wah. Let's see what you dig about it differently. Um, I tried to make a space that has a great vibe. I mean, again, likening it to you, when you had the uh, Perry Inc. cartel, I watched all that shit on YouTube. I thought it was the coolest hang spot ever. I wanted my school to be a cool hang spot like that. So that, that was inspiring. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, that, that's super cool. The idea of like the library card. That's so cool. I love what you're doing, man. That's really Thank cool. You. Thank you. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. That does mean a lot. Um, all right. I have one more question at the end, but I want to run through this rapid fire thing with you. So I'm going to ask one thing or another. Thing. Don't think about it too much. Just answer. You don't have to justify your answer unless you want it. Okay. Oh, boy. It's all music and gear stuff. It's nothing. Uh, we're not going down any holes. <laughs> okay. Humbucker or not, not? Not that we know of yet. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, humbucker or single coil? Humbucker. All right. Fender or Gibson? Gibson. Uh, then obviously Les Paul or Strat. You're going Les Paul. Uh, okay. So Strat or Telly? Strat. Les Paul or SG? Oh! <laughs> As a blanket general answer, Les Paul. There's no wrong answers. It's all good. Les you got Paul. Paul. Um, Martin or Taylor? Martin all day. Fender amp or Marshall amp? Oh, Marshall. Reverb or delay? Oh, <laughs> oh God. Reverb. Buzz or overdrive? Oh, man. I love it. I, I mean, okay, overdrive. Okay. Phaser or chorus? Phaser. That's the only answer. That's the right answer. So we're good. That's the only one that matters. All the others are right too, but that's the one that there's a definitive right answer there. So we're good. Um, Beatles or Stones? 
I know. I knew that was coming. All right, then then we're going to get – I'll save this for the last one. Okay, uh, Zeppelin or Floyd? Oh, my God. This is I, – I hate this, but it's Floyd. Okay. Then uh, Dark Side or The Wall? The Wall. Ah, uh, dude, yes. Okay. No one ever says that. That's I'm a wall guy, too. Uh, Pearl Jam or Nirvana? Pearl Jam. Uh, Hagar or Roth? Ooh. Yeah. I, I can't betray him now. I said all this stuff. It's got to be Sammy. I tell you, I was I was reading Sammy's book uh, as my son was about to be born, and my son wound up being born on Sammy's birthday. So I feel a connection to Sammy because of that. Um. Okay. Back to the Beatles. John or Paul? This is an impossible question. Uh, left arm or right arm, right? <laughs> impossible question. Um, Paul. Okay. That's my choice as well. And then finally, Lemmy or God? <laughs> this is unbelievable let me all right all right brother those those are my questions for you thank you so so much for your time this has been incredible thanks for having me man this was really fun awesome awesome um yeah dude i mean oh and one more thing i want to i i in your in your uh Rig Rundown, you talked about you test the batteries that you put into your pedals to make sure they're at a certain power. Like what? That's that's deep. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. We're still good. We're still live. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Phone malfunction out of, out of tripod. Can you still hear me and see me? We're good. We're good. Okay. My screen got a little weird, but I'm just going to roll with it. So, um... It, you're you're definitely right. Oh my gosh! <laughs> wow, this is an intense. I don't know why this thing is broken. Okay, I'm I'm gonna go handheld. Your tripod is mad at my questions for the final for for the finale. Uh, I I know that this is uh, partly crazy, crazy level of rabbit hole. But when talking about and I don't do this with every pedal, so I'm, I'm looking at my board now and I've got delay i've got my univibe an overdrive a tuner they're hooked up to a power a power supply right but when you get starting to talk about fuzzes and you're talking about specifically germanium but but for my taste all fuzzes whether it's silicon or germanium um and i don't know if it's every style of fuzz pedal that that matters as much but for sure the fuzz face the typical classic vintage fuzz face circuit okay uh, is they're very temperamental to begin with and to my ear there's nothing in the world that sounds as good as an old-fashioned nine volt battery excuse me particularly carbon zinc you don't want alkaline batteries it's not what you would think you think like oh yeah get get the copper top do or so or no they sound terrible but he's watching this and you have a Duracell battery, no offense to Duracell, put that in like your smoke detector, okay? But don't put it in your fuzz face. Your fuzz faces and vintage fuzz pedals, and I'm pretty sure tone benders are the same and, uh, and all the variants of tone benders and fuzz faces, they want carbon zinc batteries. And good news is carbon zinc are the ones you find at the dollar store, okay? They're the cheap ones, but that's what they love. So I buy them on Amazon in bulk of 50 to 100 batteries at a time, okay? So they, they come in and then I sit with a multimeter like a crazy person, put on a record and I sit down and I meter all the batteries. I, I take a multimeter and I put you know, the leads to the terminals and, and I make sure that they're all within you know, a, a spec that I find um, you know, ideal for what I'm going for. And then when it comes time for show, show time, you know, I check either on my own or when I was out on the road with Dorothy, for example, I had a great tech at that time, uh, Kevin, and we would sit and we would test batteries and make sure before the show that they were in the, the right range for the sound that I wanted. Uh, and again, it this changes over time because they're temperature sensitive. 
you know, at certain times, you know, I remember this one year, like all the batteries had to be like 7.4 volts. Now I prefer 7.9. You know, I prefer like almost 10 volts out of the batteries. My pedal, all of a sudden, that's what it sounds better as now. Could it be the climate? Could it be the location? Could it be with the position of the moon and the stars? <laughs> this stuff is so temperamental. But when you get it right, and people are like, why go through all this? Just, you know, get a more modern thing and, and make it reliable. And it's like, well, reliability has its place. You know, you want a reliable refrigerator. But, you know, I don't know that I necessarily want to trade the magic of, you know, certain guitar stuff, man. It's like there's voodoo with it, you know. And I've got a couple fuzz faces that are just the best thing in the world. That When, when in the right setting, with the right voltage on the battery, it's like it'll change your life. So that's why we go through the exercise to make sure that we have the tone that we want um, and we and we meter the batteries to make sure the voltage is at that given time within the spec that that's what my ear wants to hear. Because if they're too, for example, if the battery starts drifting down into eight, eight volts, the fuzz is going to sound completely different. It's going to feel different. It's going to start to fall apart and get a little bit spongy and all that stuff. Again, that might be the sound that you want. And if it is, then you got to know, okay, I need my batteries to be around eight volts. For me, at today's moment in time, I'm actually preferring batteries that are measuring on the high side of nine volts. And you can hear the difference. This isn't just for crazy people. Um, <laughs> you can hear the difference and you can feel the difference. And anyone who says they can't is lying. It's real. And, and, and you could, if your fuzz pedal, fuzz face has a battery, option or or a nine or a uh nine volt dc in you can a b it and feel the difference it's real and they also have to be first in the chain you want to be plugged in directly from your guitar right in your fuzz face you don't put any other pedals in front of it because it's like an, an impedance thing <clears throat> industry secrets i believe it a hundred percent because i'm the guy who would literally spend an entire sunday messing with my mid knob going here or here and I'd ask my other guitar player friend, and he'd be asking me. And my dad would come downstairs and go, "What the fuck are you guys doing?" And we're like, "Dad, this one or this one." But we, it, guitarists, we know, man. So, so I believe you a thousand percent. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are other things that you could do with your time, um, and I would always encourage people to spend most of their time. Uh, sorry for this camera malfunction. Now I'm sideways, but uh, no, you're great. I see you perfect. Uh, I, I would always encourage people to spend the majority of their time writing songs, writing songs. And if you're not a songwriter and you don't have aspirations to be a songwriter, go, like, go find a songwriter and be in their band because that's where you want to be. You want to be playing original music. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with, with cover gigs. I know people who've made a great living, probably made more money than I have playing covers. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, fine. But it all depends on what avenue you want to you want to head down. There's no right or wrong, but um, if you want to be in original music, you know the majority of of your time, I would say, invest into songwriting and singing. Um, you know, I wish I started singing. I've always sang, but I didn't embrace it as that was going to be my role in the band until until a few years ago. I wish I had stepped out and said, "I'm just going to do it on my own." After Silvertide, I would have bypassed ten years of hardship. So if anybody out there is like thinking about it, don't think about it, just do it. Um, and I've come to learn now that a lot of my favorite singers were, were guitar players who lost the singer in the band. Sure. And, and I'm just like, wow, you know, like that's, that's crazy. I, didn't, I just didn't want to deal with singers anymore. Um, I totally get it, I totally get it. So uh, anyway, we're going down different things. Uh, <laughs> Keep writing songs, keep enjoying music and, and, and playing with your friends. You know, music is supposed to be fun. So I always encourage people to just make sure it stays fun, regardless of where it is in the, in the uh, you know, if, whether it's a hobby or it's a job, if it's a passion, if it's just something you can get to every once in a while or whether it's something you do every day, all day. You got to keep it fun and, and re remember that if when you're in the trenches there, if, if it's not fun, if it's if something is a, feels weird, it's because it is weird. And like figure out what that is and get rid of it. And that could be a band member that's just like sucking energy out of the room. You know, there's no excuse for that. Like make sure that you love your bandmates because you're going to live with them in a van. 
you know, <laughs> you're all going to be in one hotel room with five or six people sharing one bathroom, you know, I, you know, s sleeping two to three in a bed, you know, you better really love these people because you're going to be in the trenches with them if that's what you decide to do. Uh, you know, the tour buses and all that stuff are great. They come later, but like, you know, you really got to love these people. So uh, align yourself with people that you, that you love as human beings and that you also love playing music with, you know, don't sacrifice one or the other because it, it never works out. It never works out. Amazing advice. Thank you. Thank you for all of this, dude. This has been beyond perfect. Incredible. Thank you so much. Um, everyone check out Nick's record. I'm going to put a link in the, in the show notes for the, when I repost this, but thank you, dude. Stay safe. Your family stay safe. And uh, I hope to catch you at a show or uh, when we get to have a NAM again or, or something, something normal. Thanks, man. I wish you all the same things. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Nick Perry, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go.